Good evening. I think now would be a good time to settle down. Make sure if you want quickly to get some more desserts, a drink. Let's give it another minute for everybody to make sure they are comfortable. Close enough. Okay. Are we good now? Okay. Every year, when the time comes in the summer for rabbis, mainly from North America, also from Europe and Israel, to come study at the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, also lay people would go there, I think for you to explore. The groups of the rabbis and the lay people would come by the end of June, beginning of July, so therefore, we speakers, in order to have enough time to prepare, we get the topics sometimes in January. Last year, I got the email of the upcoming topic, and it was, they always give a broad topic, so you can really find your place in it. And the topic for last year was justice and righteousness. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, but if you are, you would know that the majority of the speakers there and the teachers will do classical Jewish texts, biblical, Talmud, reference, etc. I'm one of the few who does modern text, and my entrance into studying about Israeli society and things Israeli is through its poetry and literature. This is what we have done in previous sessions. This is what we will do today. So the question last January, not this year, the year before, 2015, when I got the topic, right, uh, justice and righteousness, the question presented to me is, from what angle would you approach the issue of justice and righteousness in Israeli society through modern literature? I cannot do halacha, the other teachers do it. I need to do modern literature. And I am not a person, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a judge. So finally, and normally these things happen with the help of my son, Ori, my oldest, and I like to study and think together with him because he's one of the few person on earth who will never agree with me. And always, ch how could you say that, mom? It's totally the other way around. So this is why I always choose to discuss things with Uri, because I know that he will challenge my thinking. And at one point with our conversation with Uri about a year and a half ago, we go like, what if? What if we looked at how the state creates its system of justice through the lens of five major trials that happened in the early years of the state, because we are going in a few days to celebrate Yom Ha'atzmaut. And when you discuss the state of Israel, I know you guys, because you are like me. We talk about Israel, we talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We talk about Israel, we talk about the wars. We talk about Israel, we talk about politics. And I want to offer us an opportunity today to look at an angle of Israeli society that few of us had the chance to look at. How do we create our system of justice? What are the major milestones in that? So I'm now asking you, because some of you are slightly over 18, and we have memory, if you needed to think about major important trials that would help shape the sense of justice in the state of Israel, what comes to mind? The Eichmann trial. That's 1961, Israel was created in 48. Eichmann trial will be the last one we shall discuss. Can you do one more? Okay, so I know why you invited me. 
So I chose five trials, and here in our sessions, one tonight, two tomorrow, we shall do three of them, okay? So let us start. Do the pictures help a little bit for you? I will give you the names in a minute. Anything comes to mind? Ahmed is the last over there in the drawing. But anything becomes clarified? No, I didn't expect to. I'm just teasing you. OK. Tobiansky, we shall not do. I'll just mention the case. It happens during the early days of the War of Independence. A Jewish officer is accused of having betrayed the very young, six weeks old IDF by selling secrets to the Brits who would give them away to the Jordanians. On his one day of leave during the War of Independence, on June 30th, 1948, the state is exactly six weeks old. He is picked up on the Shuka Carmel in Tel Aviv, the market, put in a jeep. They have a, what they call a field court, a court martial, and he is accused and tried, and there is a verdict, and he is found guilty, and he is executed. The time span from the pickup in the market till the burial is three hours. What chance did he have to defend himself? What chance did he have for, for a sort of a semi-okay trial? Zilch. It will take about a year of the fight, really ferocious fight of the widow who would never believe his guilt for him to be totally, totally found not guilty, but we are not doing that trial, so I'm not continuing. <laughs> Look up the Tobiansky affair, maybe some other time. Beautiful, Nat and I'm looking for poetry, right? Beautiful Nathan Alterman poem about it. The widow of the traitor, the traitor's widow, quote, unquote, he was never a traitor. In 1953, we have the Kol Ha'am trial, and that's the one we are discussing tonight, so I'm not talking about it in the introduction right now. After that, we will have the Kfar Qasim affair. That's the one we are discussing tomorrow morning. It will be the hardest of them all. Some of you may want to criticize me for having brought it up to your attention, and yet I will. I have friends in other communities I go to, and one of them is a Temple Emanuel in Newton, Massachusetts, Boston, and I have a host family there, and my beloved host, Nancy, she always says, Rachel, why do you keep talking about cases where Jews misbehave? <laughs> because it's only through bringing to light the cases where Jews misbehave that we can educate other Jews to behave better. So if you want a classical case of when Jews misbehave, come tomorrow at 9.30 for that particular lecture. But I'm, I'm promising you already that although it is a case where Jews misbehave, I think you will share my pride in the outcome of what happened after that trial and how it shaped the system of justice. The next one is the Kastner affair. We shall not discuss it. It is Holocaust-related, and it's a Holocaust-related trial that precedes the Eichmann trial in which a Jew who was involved in the saving of 683 Jews from Budapest by negotiating their release with the Nazis, it's more than the Schindler's List, will be accused in Israel for collaborating with the Nazis. There will be a trial. He will be found guilty. He will appeal between the time of the first verdict and the appeal. He would be killed next to his house by two people who decided to take the system of justice into their own hands. Then he was found by the Supreme Court to be not guilty and exonerated. But that was slightly too late for him, the Kastner affair. That one we are not doing. 
And then tomorrow afternoon, we'll do the most famous of them all, the Eichmann trial. This is our program for tonight and tomorrow. And we will start with the Kol Ha'am 1953. And I'll put it in about traitors, loyalty, and freedom of speech. Now I'm going to ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. How many of you in the last six months have either, either said the following sentence or the sentence was said in their presence? Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Can I see a show of hands? How many of you have used the sentence or heard it? Israel is the only democracy. You don't have to agree. Just heard it, OK? And now my question to you is, how do you know? Where does it say that Israel is a democracy? Where does it say that Israel is a democracy? It's not in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> it's not in the weekly Parsha. How do we know that it was the document? The Declaration of the no. <laughs> Pardon? The spirit, of the spirit is nice. But in our quest tonight, we will be looking for a document. And it is based on the spirit, but we will end up having a document. The whole idea is that the first tenant of any democracy is freedom of speech. How is the language of allowing, authorizing, legalizing freedom of expression in that young democracy, how does that develop in Israel? If there are people of law sitting in the room, I welcome you. We are not going to retry this trial. We are just going to listen to the voice of Israel's poets as they relate to it. You will be meeting important Israeli figures who are neither Ben-Gurion nor Menachem Begin, not even Golda Meir or Yitzhak Rabin. I'd like to bring to this room some other figures about whom we have maybe never heard. And yet their role in building that Israel state that I trust most of us are proud of, or all of us are proud of, is not less than those other people whose name we know so well, OK? I am taking you to the year 1948, to the years 48 to 52. Israel had won the War of Independence. From the over 700,000 non-Jewish citizens of that part of the world, rather closer to a million, over 700,000, and now I'm being very, very careful in my language, and you choose the verb. Run away, opted to leave, were kicked out, were threatened to leave, were put on lorries to leave. Whichever verb you choose, they are all right. All of them happened. But the result is that when the War of Independence, February of 1949, is ended, over 700,000 Palestinians who had lived in the country are not yet there. It's my phone. It will have to shut itself. You know, it always happens. Everybody else is doing it, and then yours goes off. OK. It will take a minute. Kill it if you can. Yeah. All right. Yeah, me too. It's one of those old phones. It's a flip phone. So just press the red. Press the red. Right hand side. OK, done. Thank you. Those people who will be found in refugee camps in Lebanon, Syria, the Gaza Strip, and what we called at that time the West Bank, which was under the Jordanian Hashemite Kingdom. Obviously, they're not too happy. 
And it's in those refugee camps that we will see the beginning of the Palestinian battle against the State of Israel. But I'm talking to you about the very early stages. They've just reached across the border. The departure from home is very, very close. And many of them will try to infiltrate back, not in order to cause terrorism. That will come later. I'm not negating it. it. But it will be just in the first early months in 49. You know what they are coming back for? To collect some more fruit from their garden. To pick up some more stuff that they have left at home. You know, normal human things. There are Arabs who stay in Israel. They will become citizens of the state of Israel. And they live in towns and villages close to the border. Obviously, the people who are infiltrating will try to hide with them. What else would they do? We have a representation of the Arab citizens in the state of Israel, in the Knesset. And I'd like you to meet a gentleman. His name is Tawafik Tubi. He was a lawyer and a communist. And he represented the Communist Party. Can you please see in how many rounds of the Knesset? One to 12, uninterrupted. The oldest serving member of the Knesset to this day. An Arab lawyer and a communist, Tawafik Tubi. We don't say about non-Jews, but I think he deserved to be thus remembered of blessed memory. It comes to his attention that the IDF is searching Arab villages along the border to look for the infiltrators. And what can I tell you when the army searches at night? It's not a very polite activity. It is very painful sometimes, sometimes violent, sometimes many times inconsiderate of women, old people, privacy, intimacy of homes, etc. Tawafik Tubi, who is a member of the Knesset, takes the right to speak on the first Knesset, and he is complaining not about the searches. He understands that the military needs to search. He is asking for an investigation into the way it is done. That officers and soldiers should be investigated and for the searches when needed to be done in a humane way. That's all. The whole Knesset is yelling at him and telling him more or less to shut up, okay? Ben-Gurion, who is the Minister of Defense, and the question about the nature of the searches is addressed to him. What's Ben-Gurion's response? He commands the Knesset to erase the remarks of Tofik Tubi from the protocol. Now, I have a friend who just retired from being the major editor of the protocol of the Knesset. And she tells me, Rachel, this is a notion. It is not really erased. When there is an instruction to erase something from the protocol, it is written next to the something that it was instructed for it to be erased from the protocol. But it stays there with the remark. So it can be found. You can look it up. The following day, a major poet of Israel at the time, Nathan Alterman, I think I have discussed some of his work in this room previously, but I will remind those who have forgotten and tell those who are here for the first time with me who Nathan Alterman was. Nathan Alterman, when he died in the year 70, had left behind a volume of poetry that is like seven thick volumes. It literally stands on my desk. 
along with Amichai, because I use it so often. He is remembered in Israeli lore, not only outside of Israel, for one poem that he had written. And it's called The Silver Platter, and it's one of those poems that you read on Memorial Day for the soldiers. We are not doing it tonight. During his career, he had written abundantly, but the segment of his writing that we are interested in is a particular type of poetry rarely found in other cultures, but prevalent in ours. Alterman had a weekly column in the major newspaper of the time, Daval. You need to understand the politics and the journalism of a pre-internet, pre-Twitter, whatever time, when the different newspapers, lo and behold, are attached to certain ideologies. You have never heard about that, right? It never happens in your country. All of them are objective, and I know. But in our country, it's different. Daval belonged to the main ruling party of the time, Ben-Gurion's party, Mapai. Although I will sound cynical and maybe critical, let me tell you that I was raised in a Mapai home and I'm still voting for the same party, okay? And I'm citizen of Israel. But just because of that, I allow myself criticism because I belong, because it's my mishpoche. So the war that doesn't exist anymore because the labor party that was ruling the country at the time was Ben-Gurion is like my note nowadays. And among other things, it had lost the paper. But if we are talking about late 40s, early 50s, in a country that is basically socialist, and at the time, not today. And let me tell you that in my country yet, the word socialist is a kosher word. It's not an insult. You can call people socialists. It's fine, unlike some other cultures that I rarely come across. But anyway. It was main, the, the most important paper of the time. And people writing in it were, you know, somewhat loyal to the cause and to the big boss, Ben-Gurion. So much so that oftentimes when they criticize Alterman, and there are people who will criticize them, they will call him Ben-Gurion which means in Hebrew, it's a play on words, the one who slaps behind Ben-Gurion, okay? But it is not true, because Alterman, he is using his role as being able to write in the party's organ every week to look at an event during that week and to write oftentimes critically about it. The thing that we are going to read together freedom of expression, or how do we know Israel is a democracy, the poem is known as the reprimand to Tawafik Tubi. So the following day, after the event at the Knesset, Alterman is writing, you have the text in front of you, and I'd like you to know that every single time, that it's on your tables, that every single time that Alterman is writing, he will, the, the poem will be preceded by a few words of explanation. And oftentimes, when you, you read critically about Alterman, you will find out that these preceding words did not exist in the paper publication, but later on, when the poem is published in a book, Alterman thought that it would be worthwhile to add these words of explanation. In this case, they have appeared in the paper. So Alterman is writing to, now, and please remember, Israel is so young. It's the first year. We are, what, three years away from the Holocaust? The first time after 2,000 years that we are having a state of our own? Even today, you are hesitant about criticizing the regime in Israel, right? Very wrong, but you are, okay? Imagine then. How would a person who is critical of the government, the critical of the Knesset, critical of Ben-Gurion, writing in the party organ, how well is that received? 
No? It was very different. We are talking freedom of speech. Okay. So first of all, Alterman is turning to his readership and he is explaining who is Tawafik Tubi. The reprimand to Tawafik Tubi, who had enraged the majority of the Knesset when he expressed serious accusations about the conduct of the army when searching for infiltrators in the Galilee. Alterman is careful. And he is honest and true to the cause. Tawafik Tubi did not object to the searches. He objected to the conduct of some of the soldiers. His remarks had brought upon him reprimands, among other things, it was said that he should be grateful for the privilege he was granted to be a member of the parliament and to speak up. The vote supported Ben-Gurion's suggestion to move on on the agenda. Okay, now let's be honest for a moment. Imagine yourself in 49. How many of you would entertain, at least lightly, this thought that Arab citizens of the, city, of the State of Israel should feel grateful for the fact that we allow them to be represented at the Knesset? And if one of them was critical, we would easily find it in our heart to say, shut up, say thank you. In the next country, they wouldn't let you say that against the regime. Honestly, respond to yourself, not to me. To yourself, not to me. Is it possible that some of us would have entertained this thought? It's possible, right? We are human beings. It's possible. Look at what happens in Syria. Look, you dare do that there. This is the topic that Alterman is addressing. And this brings me to my next comment about the nature of my sessions. No matter how I love and think an important event of the past was important, I will never include it in my sessions if it has no relevance to what is happening today. This is one of the major reasons for me to pick up a certain topic. And my claim is that what Alterman is here saying to his readership still has relevance today. That's all, the rest is Alterman. So, who is Tawafik Tubi? He is a member of a Knesset, an Arab communist. Everything is in the out, it's out. Like if he wanted to say, you know who is Tawafik Tubi? He's such a nice guy, he's a lawyer from Nazareth, he's really a nice man, whatever. And then somebody would, yeah, but he's an Arab. Yeah, but he's a communist. So Alterman is not waiting for that. He's saying straight up front, all the bad stuff. So Victuvi, he's a communist and they're Arab. No. What say you? In the parliament, he's a communist, Arab in the parliament. He sits there with full rights and not out of charity. Perhaps it's time to remember this, Chavirim. Now look at the word Chavirim, plural for Chavir, friend. But ha so Alterman is talking to his buddies, right? Everybody in Israel who would dare think that we are doing him a favor. Ah, but this is because you don't understand Hebrew. How do you call a member of a Knesset in Hebrew? How do you call the member of a Knesset in Hebrew? Chaver Knesset. A comrade, a chaver, a member of the Knesset. So Alterman could be speaking to the audience at large, all of us chaverim, or he could be seen as addressing straight the chaverei Knesset, the members of the Knesset. Your choice. It's not clear in the Hebrew. The English doesn't allow you that liberty, but the Hebrew is subtle here, okay? He owes us no debt for greatness of soul. His position is legal. Boker Tov, good morning. The only democracy in the Middle East. Will you please remember, membership in the Knesset is no favor. It's not because we are so great. 
That's the way democracies function. It is a commandment, it is as basic as Aleph Bet. I'm sorry for the extra C, A, B, C, like Aleph Bet. No, the parliament should not, with waving hand, throw a get, a divorce document, at him once in a while. Wow, that's a toughie, because we thought we were so generous. We thought we were so nice. And Alterman is telling us when the state is barely a year old, not good enough. Not good enough. Do not even think about thinking that you are doing him a favor. And it should not, under any circumstances, tell him you are speaking freely because I am good, I am generous, supporter of freedom, it is not appropriate even in a private party. Private party, again, a very Israeli hint. It is an Israeli custom for sure at the time, but to a large extent even today, for friends to gather Friday evening mainly. And when Israelis gather, it's okay in Israel to talk politics. You don't have to be polite. You can talk politics. This is what we do. So every Friday evening in Israel, you have about 100,000 Knessets discussing and deciding everything. So Alterman wants to remind us, if you in the earlier standard thought that I'm talking only to the members of the Knesset, uh-uh, and all those Friday gatherings as well. Watch your words. Watch what you are saying. It is time to decide at last, like all other representatives, to be is there by virtue of the regime. And if this is serious, we should not hand him a bill to be paid for the right every other day. Huh? Okay. This is the nature of democracy. Its squires should not creditors be almost the Shakespearean language, its cry, squires should not creditors be. I bragged about my son Ori. This line is his work of translation. There is no official translation of this poem, and therefore Ori and I work together to create this translation for the session, and this, I thought this was a beautiful line. It is not easy but it is not self-evident. It will not be, if it is not self-evident, it will not be evident at all. We have to be very careful there. And now to the crux of the matter. Have you paid attention? He is not even addressing the content. And look at the subtlety. What was to be complaining about? The searches? The conduct. What is Alterman complaining about? The content of what had happened in the Knesset? No, the conduct. He is playing the same trick. He is doing a to be on the Knesset. It's your behavior that I am addressing. The way you talk to him. You can disagree with him, it's fine. But keep the conduct of a democracy. Okay, and how these things are discussed. And now to the crux of the matter. So finally, I can talk about what he said. The army combing. I kept the notion of the Hebrew word, searches srika in Hebrew, like combing your hair. This is how the army searches, like it will go into every corner. It will split apart every two hairs. So we call it srika, like combing. So Alterman is using the same word. This combing business, not a week goes by without one, and every intelligent man knows it is not a ritual of polite, creakless bowing. It's not how it's done. You know it. You know that some of our soldiers need to be watched and how they behave. It is true we do not call our journalists to attend as we do to photography parties, though it may seem if we did, they wouldn't leave empty-handed. Now, this is also interesting. 
Let's look at 49. Alterman is talking to the Knesset and to Israel at large, and he says, I know that we do not know for sure what happened there, because we do not invite journalists to accompany the army when it does the combing, as we do for all sorts of parties. Had we sent them there, maybe they would have some pictures. Now, oftentimes when Israel is criticized, and I am in these debates endlessly, of course, for misconduct of soldiers, and it happens, my first line of response is, and how do you know about it? I saw it on CNN. And how did the CNN journalists get there? Because we allowed it. Because we let him. How do we get all the, of the critical information about Israel? It's because we allow them to go and take the pictures. That's your first line of response. It comes from here, from 49. Let it be open. Let's bring it out to the air and set it right when needed. Of course, not 100%. I mean, I'm not naive. One thing is clear. When an MK, MK, member of Knesset, not Montreal kosher, <laughs> OK, with a different image of the searching is not less important than the one of the press that praises the collaboration of the populace. In those years when you wanted to look righteous and great, you would always claim in the press that the population, namely the Arabs, they fully collaborated with the regime. And the sentence kept being repeated. And Alterman is saying, this is our press saying that. Would you care to listen to them for a minute? Because they may have a different opinion. Just listen, not agree. Just listen. He had fact not yet denied. Did anybody say, did the army come forward to say it's not true before you condemned him on the Knesset? He had asked for an inquiry. So what's the outcome? No, it is unhealthy forest, this forest of hands that had already decreed a slander. Don't do that. Don't raise your hand so quickly to say slander. A member of the Knesset had asked for an inquiry? Let's do it. What do we have to hide? If we are so righteous, fine. And if it needs addressing, let's address it. The topic was removed without any debate. Is it really so empty of content that it did not even deserve a debate by us? And we come fiercely, as we all well know, is it not so good to come without combing your own hair? If we search them so closely, how about a little bit of self-search before we condemn? Okay. If a communist Arab had asked for it, it is no reason to tear the request apart. Later, he will come back to that. A week later, while well, he will need to address this, and he will add to another poem, this is not meant to slander the IDF, nor for the sake of harassing dignitaries, but in order to say that protecting honor, protect the honor of the army, Okay, is not the way when such cases need to be investigated. Also, let us say that the IDF, for protecting its honor and health, is demanding, investigate, look inside me. If blemish there is, you should fight it ruthlessly, and only then fight to be. 1949, Israel is strong enough to have this in the main newspaper, not on the front page, but on a very accessible every Friday. Can you imagine yourself that Friday morning in Tel Aviv? The war of independence is barely over. You are reading this in the paper. What's your reaction? Will you do anything? Will you keep quiet? Will you write a letter to the editor? 
Will you visit Tubi in his offices in Haifa? He had another one in Nazareth. I don't know, I was too young. My parents were Holocaust survivors struggling. Nobody had the energy for that. But Alterman was there. By the way, Tubi died uh, not that long ago. I forget the exact year. Uh, la la la. Yeah, 2011, not like five four years ago. A few years before he died, he was not an MK anymore, and people forget. There was an event in Nazareth where we had lived, and a young journalist was introduced to him and didn't know who he was. So Tupic told, Tupic Tupi told him, I was mem a member of two things he said about himself. I was a member of the Knesset, and once Alterman wrote a poem about me. <laughs> and Alterman wrote a poem about me once. Remember to Fiktubi as we go to answer in a few minutes the question, how do we know that Israel is a democracy? I needed for you to be acquainted with to Fiktubi, who is a person struggling for freedom of expression in a very young Israel. Okay. By the way, on June 24th, 2015, Deputy Minister of Interior Mazuz is saying from the podium at the Knesset, citizenship to Arabs, we are doing you a favor. And what you see in the picture is members of the Knesset rushing to the podium, giving him back their document, their Teudat Zehud, their ID card, and if the Arabs are not entitled, I do not need mine either. These are Jewish members of the Knesset. This is just to show you how relevant the issue still is in Israel. Okay? And now I'm taking you to the year 1953. Does the name Morgenthau ring a bell? I think Secretary of Finance in the Roosevelt, the Treasury, in the Roosevelt administration. By 1953, it's already Eisenhower times. He is not in official position, but I think at that year, he, he is the president of Israel Bonds. He's a Jew, needless to say, and good friend of both Ben-Gurion and Chaim Weizmann. Okay, so Morgenthau, Ben-Gurion, Chaim Weizmann. The guy is very well placed. And that year, uh, Haaretz advertises an article, publishes an article, in which Morgenthau says, it's the war in Korea, remember? That Abba Eben, or I, as I would call him, Abba Eben, had told him that should America need it, Israel will place 200,000 soldiers at its disposal to fight the fierce communists in Korea. Do you believe this? No. Could it be true? No. Is it like bullshit? <laughs> like shtuyot? Not possible. But you know it was in the paper. And Abba Evan and Morgan Tower serious people. And none of them had denied. You know. So maybe. But the whole thing like sounds really, really weird. Okay. So what happens next? Israel has two communist newspapers. One of them is called Kol Ha'am, the voice of the people, Kol, voice, Ha'am, the people. And the other is called al Iltihad. It's the same in Arabic. The editor of the, in, in the history of Israel, the Communist Party was always the only one joint Arabs and Jews to this day. To this day. <coughs> Two papers, however. The editor of Kol Ha'am is Meir Vilner. I want to talk to you about Meir Vilner. Meir Vilner is originally from Vilna. He made the Liyah prior to the Holocaust. Always a socialist, a true communist. After the Holocaust and what had happened to the Vilna community, he drops his last name 
and he calls himself Vilner. So that he will carry in his own body, his own name, the memory of his destroyed tomb community. A good Jew, right? Yeah, but the communist. Working with the Arabs, you know. How much can you trust him? Wilner is the editor of Kol Ha'am. Who is the editor of Alil Tihad? Our friend Tubi. Okay, we know him already. We know that he's a communist. And then they read uh, what Haaretz is quoting, and both papers will publish the same article entitled, Let Abba Eben, I did it the, the Israeli way, the Hebrew way, okay? I know you call him Abba Eben, but in Hebrew we call him Abba Eben, so I kept the name that way. Turn to that page. I didn't translate the whole article for you, but just the gist of it, and I need to warn you, it's such communist crap that like, you couldn't believe it, okay? But that's exactly the point. You do not have to agree with it. You do not have to. It's a classical communist rag of the time. Here goes. Let Abba Evan go to battle on his own. Like he had promised these Americans that we will place 200,000 soldiers at the service of the capitalist Americans to fight our friends. I'm now interpreting. I'm doing Midrash, right? To fight our peace-loving friends in communist Russia? Well, he wants so much to go to war. Bevakasha. Let him go. <laughs> That's the article, OK? The Bengalian Bernstein government, he doesn't even grant, the paper doesn't call it the Israeli government. It's the Bengalian Bernstein. Bernstein was for a, from a centrist party called the liberals, but at that time, liberals actually meant it was a capitalist, not a socialist party. So they hated them even more than they hated Ben-Gurion, okay? So the Ben-Gurion ben Bernstein government did not react at all to Abba Ibn's announcement about his willingness to place 200,000 Israeli soldiers to the war against the Soviet Union. There is no other way to read this silence but as a full agreement to Abba Ibn's words. So what the communist papers say, Alil Tihad and Kola Am together, had the Israeli government wanted to deny it so much? They would have. And since there is total silence from Ben-Gurion and Bernstein and the others, we communists assume that what Abba Evan had said is true, because nobody denied it, OK? OK. Furthermore, it is inconceivable that the ambassador of the Ben-Gurion Bernstein government would make such an announcement in his own name and not in the name of the government. Abba Evans' announcement is unique even among the Atlantic camp. You remember NATO, the Atlantic camp? As every government in the aggressive Atlantic bloc, you note the communist language, the aggressive Atlantic bloc, because we belong to that. They are the aggressors, the communists, but from a co communist perspective, it's the American bloc that's aggressive, okay? Seeks as much as it can to put the least number of soldiers at the service of the American generals. To this day, the ratification of the war agreement by Paris, Bonn, are still facing major obstacles. Many countries in Asia, as well as in Europe, such as Britain and India, are very critical of Eisenhower Dallas policies. So what the communist paper is saying, look at all those members of NATO. None of them is rushing to help the Americans. We have to be the first ones. Abba Evan has to be the first one. It thus seems that the Ben-Gurion government, etc., is pushing itself to the front line of the warmongers. It rushes more than any other government, even within the aggressive Atlantic bloc. Would you read the communist paper in 1949? Would you read the communist paper today? Had you read it, what would you say about this? What would be your reaction? Come on, be honest. If you read all these communist accusations of the West, what would you say? Bullshit. It's even worse than that. 
Because in the next paragraphs that I leave you to read on your own as the time is getting shorter, they are also claiming that this pact is aggressive against the peace-loving government of Stalin and Malenkov and Beria and all these chevre. You know, like, come on. I mean, you could triple your remark from a minute ago. It appears in the papers the same day. What does the government do? What does the government do? They close the papers. They close Kola um, for two weeks and Al Etihad for a whole month for good measure. You know, the Hebrew paper two weeks, the Arabic paper a whole month. Let's be fair. The Hebrew paper is a daily and the Arabic paper is a weekly, so maybe this is okay. All right? Let's be fair. So they closed them down, Kola Am and Al Etihad on the same day. Nice? What does the Communist Party do? They go to the Supreme Court. They go to the Supreme Court and they ask for justice. Both papers appeal to the Supreme Court of Justice. Who is the president of the, the chair of the Supreme Court at the time? Just a minute. Now this is an interesting fact. Who? Justice Agronat. What's so unique about Justice Agronat? Try to think. This is 53. Israel is five years old. Who would be the people who would already serve as judges? Where would they come from? What's their origin? Mainly Europe. And where in Europe? Poland, Hungary, Romania, maybe a few from Germany, who knows? Where is Agronat from? Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. Where did he go to school? Chicago the University of Chicago. He's the only judge in Israel at the time who comes from a country with some history and tradition of democracy. All those Havra coming from Poland and Hungary and Romania and Russia, give me a break. <laughs> what tradition of democracy do they carry with them no matter where they had studied? The only Western democratic voice in the Israeli legal system at the time is Justice Agranat. I want you to be proud of that, because we rarely speak of the contribution of American Olim to Israel. And this is a major one. I'm begging you, when next you go to Israel, and if you go to the Supreme Court, before you rush in to see the beautiful architecture of the building, will you stop in the plaza outside because it is named after a granat? And read one of his verdicts, which are crucial to the history of Israel. He was a judge in the Kastner trial. He was a judge here. He was heading the inquiry committee after the Yom Kippur War a major, major contribution to the way we think justice in Israel. And let's read his verdict. In Kol Ha'am precedence, Justice Agranat has stated for the first time in an official Israeli document that although the Declaration of Independence is not truly a constitution, its values are legally binding. The things declared in the Declaration of Independence, and specifically those about the founding of the state on the principles of freedom and the ensuring the freedom of conscience mean that Israel is a state aspiring for freedom. Although the declaration is not a constitutional law, 
but it expresses the vision of the people and its credo. Therefore, it is our obligation to pay attention to the things it declares when we are about to interpret and make meaning to the laws of the state, including those that were created during the British mandate and were adopted by the state following its establishment. It is well known axiom that the law of the people should be studied as a reflection of its national life system. For what is written in the declaration, we can assume that Israel is a democracy. 1953, the first document of this official document of the State of Israel that declares that Israel is legally to be perceived as a democracy. So when next they ask you, how do you know that Israel is a democracy? You go back to Agranat, 1953. Thus the privileges and the values without which a democracy is not possible must be applied. And first and above all, these privileges is the freedom of expression. The principle of the freedom of expression is a strongly bound to the democratic process. A simple understanding of a democratic regime automatically results in the application of the principle of freedom expression in any state that is founded on such regime. This elevated privilege together with its companion, the, pr the privilege of the freedom of conscience are the preconditions for the realization of all other freedoms, and I give you the sources from where I have quoted. In order to create these sessions, I've consulted additional documents, the, third, the most important of which is a famous article written by Supreme Court Judge Justice Aharon Barak, still with us, who writes about the Kol Ha'am verdict from 53, and he uses a play on words in Hebrew that I will try to translate for you. And he is saying, Kol Ha'am, that paper, Hu Kolo Shil Ha'am. Kol Ha'am is the voice of the people. Justice Agranat found the papers Al Iltihad and Kol Ha'am within their rights authorized the government, ordered the government to pay compensation for the couple of weeks that the papers were closed. Ever since then, Kola Am and al Tihad did not stop to annoy all Israeli governments. <laughs> the verdict most often quoted in the Israeli legal system is Kol Ha'am verdict. Israel was five years old when it really taught itself to start behaving like a democracy. This is the first of three trials that we shall examine on this weekend. Thank you very much.